modifying the state's open meeting law issued in March, uh, March 12th of 2020. This meeting will be held using remote participation. And uh, that means it will be recorded and it looks like it is being recorded. And uh, we have a number of items on the agenda this evening. And we always open these meetings uh, asking if there's any general public comment. And this would be comments on anything that are not, it is not related to items on the agenda. Okay, looks like no, we do not have any. We do have a set of minutes to review and approve, and these are dating to February 3rd. Did everyone have a chance to look through these? Um, I did. Uh, one thing I noticed that my name was misspelled at the top of page two, my last name. I, just a minor thing. I was going to just send you the, but that's otherwise they looked good to me. Anybody else? Motion to approve. So moved. Second. 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 Any more discussion? Okay, we need to vote. Sarah. Martha? Approved. Craig? Approved. Dylan? Approved. Barbara? Approved. Pauline? <laughs> Pauline is muted. You nod, Pauline, or shake your head <laughs> or unmute. Sorry, I approve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, unanimous, thank you. Okay, um, before we um, get started, I just wanna, we're gonna talk about this um, at the end of the meeting, but I wanted to just welcome, um, we have one with two new commissioners coming on. One is present tonight, Harvey Hill. I just wanted to acknowledge he is on the Zoom meeting. So um, everybody wave and we'll talk about this later, but thank you for, um, thank you for logging in, Harvey. I, I know you were busy, so. It's great to, great to see you. Okay, um, we have next on our agenda, a continuation um, from our last meeting, which was uh, a review of a uh, request for a certificate of appropriateness for the property um, at 330 Elm Street. Um, this is in the local historic district, map ID number 31A-002. And this is to replace the windows um, in this house. And I just wanted to, um, before we um, we hear from the applicant and representatives of the applicant, I just wanted to familiarize everyone once again. Um, I know this is, uh, was in our minutes, but I always think it's good for everyone to hear this again. Um, that the ordinance specifies, so we're, there are two options here tonight. One is to approve the, um, give a precipitate, issue a certificate of appropriateness to the replacements. And if that is not uh, something that um, is possible, the option is to issue um, a certificate of hardship. So if that is something that um, this comes to, I will talk about that at the time. Uh, when we, got, we get to that. But I also wanted to just read once again from our design standards. Everybody, if you can see this, this is what our book looks like. Um, when it um, talks about windows, um, and again, windows are one of the most important design features of any building. So this is something that we care a lot about in the district. And there was a lot of time when these guidelines were developed uh, looking at uh, the details of it. And what we're trying to, I know what is uh, up in front of us right now is replacing these. And um, we always want, especially when windows are original to the building, to make every effort that we can to save them. Um, so, but if replacement is something that is desired and they are not salvageable, the win replacement windows um, should meet the following standards. Um, replacement windows shall be all wood or clad with metal exteriors and of the same dimensions. 
for Muntins frames, sash, rails, and styles, and be of the same design, same number of panes through the original existing window. Openings shall not be reduced or enlarged to accommodate stock sizes or shapes. Complete replacement of all windows in the building in which only a few are in disrepair will not be approved. Glazing should be limited to the following insulating glass, a single glass with removable energy panels, divided lights, divided light options, meaning Munton bars, should be limited to the following. Authentic divided lights or simulated divided light with spacer bar between insulating glass. The following are unacceptable options for divided lights. Simulated divided light applied to the glass, grills between insulating glass or removable grills. Narrow Munton bars that closely match existing Munton widths um, are required. Munton bars wider than seven eighths of an inch are not acceptable. And wood clad exteriors are prefer although aluminum is acceptable provided that the profile reasonably matches existing window mountains. So that's um, just a, again, a run through again on the design guidelines, design standards for the district. So I, I believe we have um, the applicant. Am I correct about that? Welcome. Yeah, hi, sorry, I couldn't change my name on this. I apologize. I'm Perry Cohen <laughs> um, at 330 Elm. And... My name is Dallas Dukar. Nice Thank you me. for attending. It's good to see you. And I believe Jonathan Schultz is the Pella representative, correct? And, I, um, and the commissioners all received your uh, summary of your assessment of the window conditions. But we'd like to hear you um, just run through that for us, please. Of course. Yes. Thank you for having us back. And so uh, we took. Um, uh, what the commission had said from the last meeting and uh, went back and, and reassessed the windows. Um, my, my boss helped with this because unfortunately I was uh, out for 10 days in quarantine uh, with COVID. So I had, had some additional help there. Uh, so we worked together um, and I have the assessment here. So I will just recap this. So he went through all the rooms in the house with all of the windows uh, room by room and the majority of the windows facing Elm Street, I believe in fact, all of them um, showed the worst signs of deterioration. Um, and I believe that's a total of 10 that are facing directly onto the street uh, due to the putty glazing on the exterior is, is noticeably deteriorating. deteriorating. As we had noted with the pictures, all of the sills um, are deteriorating as well uh, with the condition of the paint. And then as he progressed throughout um, the house, all of the windows uh, that he looked at were in some state of that. We didn't take pictures of every single window because they are numerous. I believe there are 29 double hungs in total. And um, as we moved into the rear of the house, which from what I understand, if it's not visible directly from Elm or Vernon streets, those are not under jurisdiction, but we did assess those as well. And several of those have uh, cracked glass or missing hardware. Um, and then the windows on the uh, rear of the house, which are the originals, the double hungs, Again, we looked at those as well, even though many are obscured from the street level um, due to a, a, a wall that surrounds the perimeter of the property on the back. But uh, many of those, again, the same conditions with the glazing, um, the glass conditions, then many of the storm windows around the entire perimeter of the house are missing panes of glass. Um, but all of, the, all of the operable sashes in the double hung windows are, are noticeably loose and extremely drafty and perhaps Perry and, and Dallas could could comment more, but that was the the gist of the assessment that we completed. Yeah, thank you for having us. We apologize for not being at the last meeting. We were in New York due to a family surgery. Um, but yeah, we decided to replace these windows when we moved into this house. Obviously it's a beautiful home, um, but 
there had been very little upkeep on this house and we had to put a lot of money into doors, um, basic heating, plumbing systems. Um, so we sunk a lot trying to get it back up to the level that we believe this house should be at because it is absolutely gorgeous and we feel really lucky to be here. Um, so then when we, summer was hot, but when it came to winter, all of a sudden we noticed just how drafty the house was. Um, and we were looking into solar and learned because of both historical reasons and also we have a slate roof, um, solar wasn't possible. So we were really interested in becoming as energy efficient um, and reducing our carbon footprint as much as possible. So we realized that, um, you know, replacing the windows might be a good option. And when we met with Jonathan and Pella, um, he, he gave us the options of the divided light, um, you know, with the, I'm not sure what the actual terminology is, I apologize for this, but uh, the actual individual panes, which was twice the cost of um, what he proposed here. And we just based on kind of the cost of the house and all the money we'd already put into it, um, we thought, okay, this, this looks good. And I understand what you're saying about the, the um, actual wording of the uh, regulations. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of the backstory of our thinking on this. Um, and then we noticed that it was the same window that was on several other homes on Elm Street. Um, and when we looked at that versus what we have now with the storms on the outside, um, to us at least, it looked it looked a lot better. And that was what we were trying to, to kind of restore the home as much as we could to, to where we thought it had been and probably should be. So, um, you know, we understand kind of where, where you're coming from and the um, technical aspects of, of what you're looking for and where, I guess hoping we can come to some sort of um, solution that's both energy efficient, addresses certainly keeping this home looking as it should, um, and maintaining you know the historical kind of values of Northampton. I mean, it's part of why we live here. We love this town, um, and also just not having to spend twice the cost um, on the windows if if at all possible. Is there anything you want to share? No, I think that that pretty much summarizes it. I would I would just say. To me, it boils down to our carbon footprint, being able to be as energy efficient as possible and preserve the, the outward appearance uh, and historical integrity of the house, which I would just say the, the outward appearance is fading. And so we, we really have a, a vested interest in uh, helping to maintain that. Yeah. I think the one other thing that we learned, um, we have two kids and there was lead paint in all the original windows um, and they're the ones with the rope on them. Um, I don't know what the term is and all that, but uh, part of the replacement also was to mitigate some of that lead paint in the house. All said. Um, okay, so uh, commissioners, do you have questions for the applicants? Well, oh, yeah, this is Barbara. I, I do have a question about, um, it, you did bring up the lead paint issue and I, I, I'm not certain about this, but it seems that if a window's removed that has lead paint, you might still need to get, my question is, would one still need to have um, it done by an abatement company? Um, and, um, you know, there are ways to, uh, again, have an abatement company uh, come remove lead paint and you can paint over that and it's acceptable. I'd search, maybe it's called encapsulation or something. So, um, you know, just totally getting rid of the windows is not the only way to mitigate the, the lead paint. Um, that was one comment I had. And I hadn't heard before that the windows with true this is with true individual lights you said are two times the cost of the windows that you're thinking of getting that have a removable inner interior grill. Is that, is that correct? Yep, that's what Jonathan folks okay. at Pella told but us. What's the difference between the cost of the window you were thinking of, which again has the fixed grill on the outside but not on the inside versus the cost of windows that have um, the, uh, it's not divided lights, but have the muttons between the panes of glass so that oh. they're not removable. Yes, if, if I may, when, when we had met 
a few weeks ago, we had originally proposed the removable wooden grills on the inside mm -hmm. pane of glass, which we understood were not acceptable. So the, the, the cost to move to a, a true divided light window, which we do offer, which I, I brought the sample of and we revised uh, what, we, what we were proposing with the three main facings of the house on Elm Street and Vernon Streets with those true simulated divided light grills with a spacer bar between them. They are almost twice the cost of the windows with the removable inner grills or those wood grills that are removable on the inside pane. They are significantly more expensive. Right. And, you know, living in an old house myself, I'm, it's, um, um, you know, windows with some of the things that you mentioned were cracked glass or, you know, blue sash or something. I mean, all of this, if one wanted to, it's all repairable. And I don't know whether you've gotten estimates for what repair would cost on some of your windows versus replacing. And um, if you're concerned about energy efficiency, there are interior storm windows, uh, which which could be another option. Again, if, if, if I may add to that during my, my quarantine time, I actually researched the, the costs and companies for restoration. And uh, there, there was a study done a few years ago that said many of the same things, Barbara, that, that you were mentioning um, where Yes, the windows can be restored. They can have weather stripping added to them. Uh, they can have inner you know, storm panels or exterior storm panels added. They can have shades added. And then the cost to do that in addition to time and multiple companies coming out is comparable in cost to replacing the window. And with the window, it provides a singular solution versus having multiple companies be that abatement companies for the lead, window restoration companies, shade companies, even from a cleaning standpoint, cleaning companies come, just simply involves a lot more entities and, and the time um, involved to do that was considerable. And that was mentioned in the, in the studies and then some of the, um, some of the commentary for folks that had actually done the work or done the restoration work said, yes, it is it is incredibly time intensive. There is potential to save some cost there, but by the time you do all these things and have these multiple companies come in at that point, the, the cost is very comparable to, to replacing the window um, versus, versus a restoration. Barbara, any other questions? Um, one thing I also was thinking about looking at the windows would be, you know, the issue of requirements of the district for those windows that face the street versus the ones or, or ones visible from a public way versus ones at the back of the house. So it might be possible to have different solutions for those. The other issue is you, and I noticed when I, you know, when I looked at the house, you can't see much in the back because of that high um, brick wall. But unfortunately, I think for our purposes, we don't consider that permanent. You know, somebody could take that brick wall down and then those windows would be visible. I don't know if that really needs to come in play now, but I know that sometimes when other projects have come, we've said, you know, a fence or a wall don't necessarily um, negate thinking about somebody being able to see those at some point in the future, that, that view. Yeah, just to um, clarify, the windows in the back, there's some really beautiful curved windows. Um, we're not replacing those, those are too expensive. We're gonna do an interior French door to mitigate the weather issue back there. So we're not, we're not talking about those at all. Um, and also the room we're in right now is, a, is an office that looks to me like newer construction, and these are definitely not original windows. They have, I would say, really cheap looking fake, like uh, divided light panels thrown on them. Um, 
And the same in the kitchen, um, those are Pella windows, which were replacement windows anyway. So almost everything on the back, um, except for maybe the kid's bedroom would not be replaced um, at all. Or if it is being replaced, it would be an upgrade from something that was put in probably in the eighties. Colleen? Yeah, well, I just think, um, you know, I know that you haven't owned the home yet for even a year. I don't think it's been a year that you've owned it. Um, and I just think that, you know, it, it's, it's a beautiful home. I think it's one of the, you know, nicest homes on Elm Street. And um, I, you know, I just feel that being it was in such a high price range, um, and you knew that it was in the historic district. I think that it's really, in this case, um, it's important to maintain that historic, you know, the historic features of the home and um, looking for substitutions um, without the, you know, authenticity of the windows to me isn't, just isn't uh, acceptable. You know, I appreciate the lead issues. Um, uh, I appreciate the lead issues, but again, you know, as Barbara said, that can be that, you know, er, all the issues could be remedied and then, uh, you know, the original windows will be there. They'll be in better condition and energy and efficiency can come with an interior uh, storm while maintaining, you know, the character of the home, the original features of the home. Thank you. Dylan? <clears throat> um, I, I really appreciate your efforts to um, think about the preservation of the home and to try to move towards being more carbon neutral. And I think that that's not to be um, ignored here. I think I think that's a great goal. Um, I, I do think that the guidelines are very clearly written. And so I do hope that we could find some middle ground here, but I'm just not hearing the middle ground come out in our conversation so far. Um, I don't know what it is. I'm not as familiar with the, with the district guidelines and the work in creating the district as some of the other members, but uh, um, it's, it is a truly beautiful home. I spent a lot of time there in my teenage years. I had a friend who lived in that house. I've stood in that kitchen and, and been up in all those bedrooms. And I'm really happy somebody's purchased it that's interested in preserving it and doing the work. Um, so I hope we can find find a solution here, but I don't have it myself. If I can just pose the question, is it with with the addition of the divided light grills, that was a primary point of our last meeting and and being able to change that, which which we have discussed and Perry and I have discussed that and um, added that to, to enhance the appearance on the, the side of the house facing Vernon Street and then the two facings on Elm Street. Is that, is that alone enough to, to help us towards that compromise or is there additional information that, that you all are, are still looking for even beyond the assessment that we've provided? Well, I, I do, I do, I mean, I, Craig, why don't you ask your questions and I'll, I'll ask. Well, I just want to talk about what I know a little bit about the house. I know that it's been sold probably three times in the last 10 -ish years. There was a major league asbestos abatement project going on there a couple of years ago. I know Pella windows. I have Pella architectural series windows at $4,500 a piece on the front facade of my house. I also know as a realtor that vinyl windows are not the solution of the 21st century. You always live to see your vinyl windows fail. I'm glad we're not having that conversation here tonight. I like the idea of 
of uh, two-phased approach on the dramatic Elm Street and side street sides that the prim and proper things are there. And on the back side, a lesser cost solution or even just a temporary solution of indi uh, individual interior storm windows just to get you through a few years. Or maybe on the outside, just to preserve the, uh, uh, the exterior to a degree. But I'm a firm believer in the historic district's robustness. And if things are done incorrectly, we will, we will always remember. There are some houses that you pointed out recently that, or some buildings, let's say, that were not done properly. Thank you for pointing that out to us. Eventually they'll be back again, or if they don't come back again, they'll be back. And so um, I appreciate all that you've done in your antique historic house. I wouldn't live anywhere else but an antique historic house. And uh, I think it's very important for New England communities to maintain this. You know, you're dealing with one local historic district here. I don't know if you know the history of these entities, but they don't get created because on a whim. They get created because it was a cataclysmic thing that took place. And I can go into any local historic district in Massachusetts within 15 minutes, I'll know what that cataclysmic thing that took place. And there are some communities that have seven local historic districts. I don't know how they got through that, but there are seven. And these are the professional grade local historic districts where people who care about their community serve on historical commissions, or even a, a subset. There used to be a subset for the Elm Street Local Historic District, but now it's merged into, excuse me, the General Historic District. But I thank you for coming to town. Thank you for all that you're doing. And thank you for listening to us and, and hopefully we can find a, a good common ground here. Um, so, Jonathan, I just have a couple of questions about the conditions assessment you did. Please. Um, yes. You mentioned the broken windows. Um, the paint is cracked. You said show some images of that. Did you? Is there any um, wood decay? Do you notice that at all? Somewhat behind the storm windows where water has penetrated on the storm windows that are missing the panes of glass and has settled down onto the sill. There is some slight deterioration there, but. Um, but not majorly. No, it was more directly on the surface of the windows and the sashes themselves with the, the grills and the facing of the windows that, that you can see from the street where the the glazing is actually deteriorating considerably off of the face and then it's flaking and, and what have you. Okay, so Barbara noted that, that that all can be repaired. I think you know, one thing that would make me um, come to a, a decision that I'm comfortable with, and I can't speak for everyone else, but would be if, um, you know, a, a, a person who does a historic window restoration, a tradesperson, could provide us with a detailed uh, analysis of what's going on here and a price. So we have something to compare. Um, and I'm not saying that your assessment is incorrect, Jonathan, that's not the case, but that's not what you do. You, um, you sell and, and install new windows. Um, and I just, um, I would be, more comfortable I knew the extent of repair that needed to be done because it is very, you know, it's very hard to, um, to let these historic windows go. You know, they've been around, this house was built in 1910, was it 1910, 1920? You know, they're over hundred years old. And um, I was just thinking when I was reading this, um, the Forbes library and Bar uh, Sarah, I'm gonna need your help on this one, um, recently restored a lot of their windows with um, community preservation funds. And 
um, they were all original. Am I wrong, wrong about that, Sarah? Can you? Uh, no, that, that's correct. Um, and the, the project was a significant expense, but the windows are also extremely large and, and have some specific concerns. And um, Dylan might be able to add a little bit about oh, yeah, the, the details of the project. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, Dylan. Yeah, there's 170 something windows or something like that in that <laughs> building. And some of them are much taller than me. Um, and they were in extremely bad shape. So it was it was very expensive. Um, but you know, it the the building is is functioning much better after the work and you know Community Pre Preservation Act made it happen. Um, so Dylan, what was involved in that, do you know, in terms of the trades persons that were working on them? I don't, but I could certainly find out easily. Um, I could just email our buildings people. Um, and I'd be happy to pass that you know, those names along to anyone who is interested. Um, they did wonderful work and we haven't had any issues. Yeah. Hmm. Does anybody else have any other comments? Um, I, you know, I'm happy to entertain a motion at this point and then we could have a further discussion and decide what we're going to do um, depending on the outcome. So, so Martha, I could just say that one of the reasons I was asking about or, or mentioning repair versus um, replacement was because, you know, I didn't see that price comparison. Um, so it's, it, I agree that it, that would be something that would be very useful for us to have. And, and I'm looking at that here and actually my research, I may actually have that where I could present it here if you'll give me just a moment. Um, if that if that would be helpful, just these are things that have been documented um, through through studies that have been done and through some independent folks that have actually had the work done. Bear with me for just a moment. But I, think, fine, but I think that a study or you know an average or something is one thing, but I feel like we need the specifics of, of this company. house. I agree. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. It, are, are all the windows in question or are we just talking about the ones on the Vernon and the Elm Street side that are original? Because um, some of these aren't, as I mentioned, are not original. Um, Correct, yes. And so it's anything that's a bit, uh, visible from a public way. And then if they're being, if they're all, they're newer oh. windows that are being replaced, um, the guidelines do address that. Um, and um, I, I don't need to read that, but there, if you ha you can go online and get these guidelines are on the city website, and you can look at exactly what um, they're saying here, what we say about it. So, but I guess my question is, are we are you all deciding on the whole house right now, or just the just the historical ones? So it would be anything that's visible from a public way. Okay. So if you have um, historic windows that are visible from a public way, that would be it. You know, th those would be included. Um, if you have historic windows that are not visible from the public way, that is not within our purview. Okay. Um, and then if you had, you know, replacement windows that were put in like, you know, that are cheap and like you described in your um, study or your kitchen um, that are visible from a public way, we would need to look at that too. But obviously we're not gonna ask you to restore, you know, some cheap windows that were put in in 1980. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Does, does any commissioners have any other questions? And would, if not, would someone like to make a motion? So we're, I make a motion that um, the owners of, uh, of this Elm Street property uh, follow through with getting estimate from professional reputable uh, window restoration company so that we can get a cost for comparison um, basis as to uh, the difference in the price between restoration and replacement. Okay. Uh, does anyone want to second that? Craig, is that you waving your hand? Yes. Okay. All right. Is there any further discussion? 
I'm sorry, there was a distraction in my house. Did that include continuing this hearing yeah. or that it would come back to another meeting? Okay. And um, I should also say, if that is something that we decide, well, we can, why don't we vote first, then we can talk about it. So if there's no further discussion, um, then we should take a vote. It looks like there is not any. So Sarah. Martha? Yeah. Craig? Dylan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Pauline? Yes. So, you know, we this commission meets once a month, um, the last Monday of the month, which is, it's uh, gonna be about four weeks from now. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, we need to meet again within 30 days of this meeting to continue this discussion, correct? So it's... Do, and my question is, do we need to take this up before the March meeting? Based on the ordinance, yeah. I'd, so we, um, so we'll we'll need the applicant's permission to continue beyond the thirty days, since the first hearing would will run up against that the thirty days date. Okay. Okay. So it is. Meet, do it at your next meeting, which may be just beyond thirty days. So the. First hearing was held on uh, February 3rd. So the, the 30 days would, would run up on uh, March 3rd. But with your permission, we could continue that longer. Okay. So we could do it um, either at our next meeting, which would be the end of March, or we would have to schedule a special meeting to take this up. Okay. All right, well, I think it'll take us a little while to get an estimate, so. Um, end of March seems okay. Do you think that, um, Dylan, you mentioned you might be able to get some names. Do you think someone- Yeah, I, I found them, or I found the names that are public as with the announcement. So the architects were Jones Whitset out of Greenfield and the contractors were Renaissance Builders out of Turner's Falls. Um, those are the, oh yeah. So they're not window specialists, they just, they also do and it that. doesn't seem so. I was looking for a third name in there, but um, but I will also ask our, our uh, buildings people in case there was other people involved. They may have just been, they were the ones, we had to remove the windows, take them off site to be restored and then put them back on um, because they're very, very large. Um, so. it's, a, it's also possible, I'm, I'm on the board of Historic Northampton and I can't remember, I think we've had window work done as well. So you might um, get in touch with people at uh, Laurie Sanders is one of the co-directors at Historic Northampton to ask for a name. Okay. And I just emailed Sarah my list of historic renovation window people. Oh, great. And about the so you have that. Okay. And I'll forward that along to you right after the meeting. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so there are a lot of resources out there and you know there are a lot of old buildings in New England. So um, okay, great. So we will um, plan to reconvene at the next meeting to take this up and um, we'll look for your um, information ahead of time. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you okay. Um, the next item on the agenda is the porch on the old school building in the cemetery. And um, I, I was interested to see that, I think it was what you sent Dylan, um, the, that you sent around, that this was called the Clough, the, is it Clough, Clough, Slough Hill? Slough, Slough Hill School. So in England, they call that Slough. Oh, okay. Um, it's well, I the, could easily be line. saying it. Wrong. London and Oxford, so they call it Slough. Yeah, but I don't know. I was interesting that they called it that. Well, uh, it, was, it was built in 1876, and in the early records, they just referred to it as the Catholic Cemetery School. Okay. Um, and it doesn't appear a lot in early records. Um, but then, <laughs> then it was given a name. 
And then in the 30s, in 1931, um, they finally put in electricity and did some renovations, which doesn't mention the porch at all. Um, and then in 1936, there was a fire, which led to the replacement of some slate roof and um, some a lot of interior um, work. Um, but again, doesn't mention the porch, but I, that was the only picture that I could find so far of it. Um, but you can see on the porch railing so, some difference from how it looks today. <laughs> it's divided in the middle. And, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. that was 1946 that that picture was published. So, so the, the other question I had was there's a, um, is it a, um, a vent on the roof that um, object on the roof? <laughs> um, <laughs> It looks like a you know mushroom that is used for uh, venting a commercial stove. I know that's not what it's for. It does. It or does. Maybe, it looks, maybe it, venting the the ill the um ill behaved children. I don't know. The, it, the, it looks very out of place for the time too. Um, they the fire the fire started in the ductwork, so it may have been that they're mm. they overcorrected <laughs> to create this huge <laughs> vent wow. on the roof. Okay. So, so Dylan, you had sent this to us in an email very recently. It came right or, before the meeting, Sarah. Oh, yeah. right before the meeting. Okay, yeah. you know yeah. what? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I see it now. I wanted to get it up on my screen again. I had looked at it really briefly. Yeah. It was a brief newspaper mention. It mentions that this how the schoolhouse was featured on Ripley's Believe It or Not, which must have just been a print thing at that point, because I can't believe there was a TV show of Ripley's in 1946. Um, what? <laughs> because it was creepy. Did it say why? <laughs> that they had a school in the cemetery. <laughs> they called it the only one room schoolhouse in the cemetery in New England, which I don't think is true, but hmm. they, yeah. they thought. Okay. Well, on that note, um, <laughs> so we uh, just to ever remind me, everybody, at the last meeting, um, Paul McCutcheon came, and I believe he's here tonight. I see Marcel, so that must mean Paul. And um, and we discussed this proposed project. And as I recall, uh, Paul, you were just beginning to kind of gather some information about it. We had a lot of questions for you. So it looks like you um, were able to pull together a rehabilitation uh, summary, which is very helpful. Thank you for doing that. And has everyone seen that? It came with our meeting materials. Um, uh, I'm, I'm taking that as a yes. Okay. So um, Paul, do you want to um, give us a like a rundown of what you're planning on doing here? Excuse me interrupting. I've just joined. Jonathan, welcome. Having been, having been va vaccinated. Okay, so good. Good for you. Late. Congratulations. I have, nothing, I have nothing intelligent to say. Okay, <laughs> well, that's okay. Um, we are in the middle of a meeting, and after this item, we're going to um, we're going to welcome all of you formally. That's so, a, just sit tight for a minute. Okay, Paul, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, you you could just give us a summary. That would be wonderful. Um, so Jonathan and Harvey, just so you know, this is the uh, little schoolhouse that sits in the cemetery on Hatfield Street, um, uh, just on the other side of the bike path in Florence, or I guess it's not Florence, but uh, just on the other side of the bike path, um, bike path, and um, it is privately owned now, but there is a preservation restriction on it. And so we are in charge of reviewing any changes to the building. And Paul McCutcheon is the contractor and he is here to uh, give us a rundown on what he's planning to do. So uh, Paul, you're muted. Okay, there you go. The best I can say is that uh, I want to make it look as probably as similar as what is there now because I don't really have much else to go by, even though it's not necessarily totally accurate. It's probably not far off what is acceptable to the board. I think some of the concern was the materials that I had proposed. Uh, I want to make it as maintenance free as possible. That probably won't be uh, within the realms of the amount of pressure treated, which I had previously uh, suggested. But I think the porch can be duplicated 
to you know nearly as uh, original as I guess the evidence that I have to to duplicate. You know, I don't. I didn't come across any better information either, other than looks. You know, what I'm saying I don't know that uh, I could specify any different building materials than than what's available now, and, and keeping it within character. Okay, so um, just before you uh, you conclude, um, did you see the photo? Have you seen the photo that Dylan uh, found? No, nope, the homeowner sent me one that was okay, certainly so aged, but it it still had the iron pipe rail and the stairs off to the left. Okay. Um, okay, so why don't you just, if you can just give us a really brief snapshot of each of the, diff, each of the different systems that you, you uh, outlined, the roof and um, the roofs, the, the roof supports, the handrail, the porch, just run down that for us, that would be great. I will indeed. Uh, the roof, it, it, I would propose using shingles, a, uh, two reasons. One, it's convenient. Uh, the other thing is the longevity. Uh, rolled roofing, believe it or not, was a product of the late 1800s, but it really isn't a long-lived roof. Granted, the shingles aren't uh, accurate necessarily, but they aren't really within view of the road either. They, you won't, I don't think that will upset the, uh, the, uh, facade of that building for lack of a better excuse. Metal roofing was common, but it's a money issue to a degree. Um, so that's my proposal for roof. All the trim would be uh, Eastern white pine primed and painted. Uh, the color, I guess, is going to be su uh, subject to approval. Handrail, it says in the, in the deed for the house that they would like to see the metal handrail stay. So we'll have to, you know, we'll have to navigate that as time comes. And then other than that, um, floorboards, I don't know what would have been appropriate for that time. It's, I believe, two by six there now. That certainly wasn't historic. I'm proposing something uh, like a, it's a five quarter by six or true one inch thick, six inch wide cedar decking, which is certainly more contemporary, but also, well, you know, it has a good longevity. Probably one of the more accurate would have been uh, tongue and groove fur, which right now I would be very surprised if there wasn't a hardship in acquiring it because of the COVID and the shortage of materials in the building industry. So other than that, I, I do want to make that porch look identical to what it is. Some of the materials are going to be modern, but I don't think that'll upset the aesthetics, in my opinion. The, I'm sorry, the last thing is lattice, and the lattice I would mimic generally what's there and I can do anything from handmade lattice which is certainly within the realms to pressure treated which would be painted but in appearance would look like it is to whatever may be a custom uh, scenario for underneath there and, and certainly in the day the carpenters would have made their own lattice so it may not be the square pattern that we're all seeing there now. And I think that's my synopsis. And the light, you have the light also. Here yep, I sent that along. Yeah. When you say the square pattern that's there now, do you mean that it would that it may have been on a diagonal or that it might have been a different scale? Sometimes it would have just run a vertical lath, uh, say every inch and a half, and it would be a vertical slit. It wouldn't be a cross hatch of you know, horizontals and verticals. And again, I haven't seen the antique photo that has been sent through yet. Mm -hmm. And I have a question about, you had said the porch ceiling would be tongue and groove, which you would paint. Probably pine. Oh, that would be pine probably, okay. But, but not for the um, deck. You said pine you said, really isn't. No, I know. Not, I wasn't suggesting pine, but you were saying it would be difficult oh, oh, oh. to get the right kind of uh, fur to uh, to do a tongue and groove there. Yeah, and I'm not sure of the availability. In all honesty, they're they're truly their um, most flooring uh, available these days is some kind of a synthetic. Even the tongue and groove is, believe it or not. So, 
The synthetics I do want to stay away from. Yeah. Are you, are you just, just curious? Because of the price of lumber these days, is synthetic more expensive than than uh, wood? Some of the synthetics aren't even available oh. because they're factory made. It's a issue as most factory issues right now with uh, uh -huh. lack of employees, et cetera, et cetera. Boy, oh boy. You know, there was one other thing I was wondering about the roof, you know, where, where you're proposing putting shingles. Um, and you said that a metal roof would just be too expensive. It kind of surprising because it's not a very big roof. Standing seam metal typically yeah. is five times the price of a shingle roof. Oh my gosh. Wow. I had no idea. Wow. Well, metal panel roof is fairly inexpensive, but it also looks fairly inexpensive, uh -huh. which is the three foot wide metal panels. Mm. Um, Dylan, do you have any questions for Paul or comments? I, I don't. I mean, you know, I, we'll get you this picture as far as the railing is concerned. You might be able to, it might be helpful in convincing them to go back to an earlier look. Um, Martha, you might be able to better describe than me the difference in what the railing looks like, but it's, it's, not, it's not pipe. It's broken up halfway between the front edge of the porch or the front corner in the house. Um, looks to be wood. I wish I had a better picture. This is newsprint and has all the qualities of old newsprint, um, but hopefully it'll be helpful. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. It, do, it is because it does have, it's a two rail and then there is a, um, you know, a, a dividing um, vertical rail in the middle, mm -hmm. which kind of breaks up the, um, the horizontal part of that. Yeah, Sarah's screen sharing. Oh, there we go. Okay, I was looking at my other screen. I'm I'm all for that. My problem is it's actually in the deed that I keep the metal rail there. Okay. So I don't know how to circumnavigate the legalities of that deed. Quite frankly, is it the metal rail on the porch or the the steps? Uh, I believe it says the porch. I don't think it addresses the steps. But obviously, it's the same, you know, architectural feature. So, I was surprised to see it in the deed. Honestly, yeah. right. It's written sort of oddly, um, since the historic commission is the entity charged with reviewing any work proposed under the restriction. If, yep. if they find that this is more appropriate, that would that should be totally fine. Oh, super. Um, yeah, I, I don't think anybody had this information when that was originally written. It, they may have made assumptions that things were original when they actually weren't. The last person I would have to satisfy would be the building commissioner for, uh, I don't know how he will view that for, I don't know what your authority is to his, let's, let's say it that way. Um, I, this, so he kicked this up from his office when he got the building permit. I don't know if you filed a formal application or just a discussion, but he wanted to make sure that any review that was necessary was Oh, super. So I can, permit. okay. I can have that discussion with him when the time comes. Just in general, I was very pleased to see, you know, more pine and less pressure treated and that the pressure treated posts will be faced in, in, in pine. I, I, that, um, mm -hmm. That made me much happier. Yeah. Sure. Are we, is there a consensus that we would like to see the pipe railing go, that it be removed and something else be, you know, be put in, be installed? That's certainly something that could be proposed, um, Aline. Yeah. Um, Craig, do you have any questions or comments? No, I, I like the, the pipe railing. I like that it's been called out to be protected in the deed. I like the contractor's work in searching everything and coming up with creative workable solutions for all the oddities associated with this. Looking forward to seeing it get done. This is uh, 
very good project for us to be a part of. Thank you. Uh, I, I just had one question about the material um, in most, I think mostly for the decking. Well, if you uh, considered and thought or worked with thermal treated wood, such as thermal treated ash, which is extremely durable, long lasting, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a synthetic. <laughs> uh some of the pro ash isn't nearly as durable as you know what i'm saying though i'm not familiar with it being uh, treated in any way but i do know yep. that ash isn't by itself isn't well suited for outdoor no it's not yeah it's not just plain ash it's thermally treated ash um okay. which is it's um the 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 uh, cellular structure of the of the plant of the tree the the um, wood is actually broken down so that it doesn't um, absorb as much and uh it just makes it a very very long lasting durable sort of rot resistant um, it's being used a lot more as a substitute for um, tropical hardwoods so it's just something to look into sure yes um okay any other comments do we want to take a motion? Someone want to make a motion? Could I propose something at this time? Um, sure. Yeah. Just that I may get approval for just the structure and we fine tune the handrail scenario. The reason being is this is a second egress to that building and the stairs have failed and the roof is failing, which means they have no second egress at this time. So if I could at least get my permit in the pipeline, I'm certainly not gonna start until we have frost out of the ground. But if the handrail was a sticking point, I wouldn't want that to affect my schedule for, for lack of anything but a selfish reason. So meaning that you would just uh, like approval about the structure without the, um, the, the rail this time. Correct. I don't see why we can't do that. It, it seems reasonable, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So would someone like to make a motion? Um, I will move that we approve the proposed rehabilitation of the porch at 52 Hatfield Street, um, but that the um, form or that the railing uh, be uh, resolved at a later date and a, a, a approved or sorry reviewed and approved at a later date so we're requesting that paul come back with that information in a subsequent meeting okay yeah Ed, okay. second i second go ahead hey, Dylan? okay any more discussion well do that what i'm wondering i mean craig said he likes the handrail. The handrail was specifically mentioned in the deed that it be uh, that it be preserved. So, is there a need for further discussion about the handrail then? Um, well, Sarah just said that it's very uh, kind of vague. So it sounds like we may have some, there's some flexibility with that. Is that, am I interpreting that right, Sarah? Yeah, it specifically mentions the handrail. I'm just trying to pull up the exact language, um, but it, it doesn't, it's not so specific that it would prohibit um, changes to. So it doesn't specify size or material or. It doesn't, uh, no. You know, uh, height or attachments yeah. or finish. No. So it could be interpreted as there needs to be a handrail there, maintained. I'm okay. sure that the modern code will require different height and probably different gapping schedules between each layer of height of the pipe. It's going to be more of a wall of pipe than what was originally built. But I like the idea of the pipe anyway, because it's kind of a, there's several houses around town, they have pipe on them because it's a longer lasting material than, than wood in any shape or form. And, you know, I, I believe we're gonna, the building code is gonna specify at least height, probably 
fewer gaps for kids to fall through. I'm sure it's going to be complicated, but I just like the idea of the pipe still being there. Okay. It's funny because I see the pipe as something that's a new, you know, I'm not as accustomed to seeing pipe in on older homes. And, you know, I'm used to seeing wooden, you know, wood railings. And when I see pipe, I'm thinking, I, my mind goes to more modern, contemporary, industrial look. You know, I see, I, I, that's where my mind is going with the pipe. I'm going to take you on a ride through Florence, Paul. <laughs> I'm going to have to pay more attention. I think the pipe is probably a good use there because it's 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 an institutional building. You know, we, I think we all think of it as being a home now, oh, yeah. but it once was a school. Right. And the pipe was probably good for keeping kids from chewing on it or whatever else they would have done. Mm. <laughs> Although I think we have evidence that there probably wasn't in place for much of the time when this was the school. This photos, this photos 70 years after the school was established and there's no pipe there. And it's a completely different kind of railing. No. Okay, so does, does the uh, motion still stand then? It, but I believe it does. Okay, so uh, any more comments? All right, then Sarah, we're ready to vote. Um, and hang on one second before I call the the vote, I'll just read the exact language from the restriction. Uh, it says, I just had it. Registry of deeds has very small print. Um, it, so th the extent of the language in the restriction is no changes to the front railing system, which is not very specific. Railing system. But to me, that is to me, I read that as being very specific. That they want what's there. But but to what what do, what's the date? Like to what railing system is it referring? Mm -hmm. What's the date on the restriction or the deed, Sarah? Two thousand two. Okay. Uh, what date was it? 2002. Okay. Okay. I think we should vote and we will um, discuss this at our next, our next meeting. I right. want um, we have a little more information from Paul about how he plans to address this. So, okay. Martha? Yes, to the motion. Craig? I support it. Dylan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Pauline? Yes. Unanimous, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, all right, we have two new um, commissioners coming on soon. Uh, not been sworn in yet, but they are both in attendance tonight. Thank you so much for making the time to do this. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves? And we can tell you a little bit our, about ourselves as well. So Harvey, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Uh, so let's see, we, my wife and I moved to Northampton for two years in 2007. And uh, 2009, we moved back to Georgia, which is where we came from, and we moved back up here in 2011. So mm -hmm. it's my 10th consecutive year. I don't know how y'all are. That still makes me feel like a little bit of a newcomer. Um, my wife is a faculty member at Smith College, and, uh, and I'm a priest, an Episcopal priest, with serving a church in Agawam. We've got two sons. One is working as an actuary. He's actually an actuary's office, not an actuary himself in, uh, in outside of Boston. And my other son is a senior in college at Middlebury College. Great, well, welcome. And I assume you have an interest in history. <laughs> I do. I actually have a PhD in, in religious history and used to teach that at a college in Georgia. And um, when we moved up here, one of the things I tried to do to sort of root myself in New England, since my, my actual roots are all in Georgia, was to read as much as I could on local history. And so, um, so that has become a, a hobby of mine. So you came to the right place. 
because we're old. <laughs> we're old. There's a lot has happened here, and a lot of it's really interesting, and a lot of it's really important. Yes, a great religious history, and a lot of religious history in particular. Yeah. You know, I'm interested what your wife's name is because I worked at Smith for a long time. Like Carrie Baker. Oh, what sure. Is she in? I know Carrie. Oh. What department? So she's in the. Uh, she teaches women's studies, so it's the SWAG, the program for the study of women and gender. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. I she know Carrie. Well. I know well. Carrie. She knows me. Well, I'll pass along your greetings. Yeah, thank you. Um, Do that. Yeah. And Jonathan, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, so please help us with that. Uh, I, I know the French dish, the dog, but I'm sure that's not how it's pronounced. No, in, in French, it's the cheapest cut of meat that you can find. <laughs> uh, I, I pronounce it Dauby uh, and lived in Northampton for about five years. We moved here on retirement because of children and grandchildren, the best reason. And I, I know Craig, and he knows me, I guess, because uh, we've been on the Friends of Northampton trails for a while. Uh, I bring no specific skills to this, but I'm an avid reader of, of history. I've been in education all my life. I was a school superintendent for five years and a college president for over 30. That was enough. Uh, <laughs> You're here. You're surviving. So I, I expect to, to learn a lot. Great. Well, so happy to have both of you. Um, just you know, briefly, Dylan, why don't we just tell Jonathan Harvey uh, a little bit about ourselves? Dylan, do you want to start? I'm Dylan Gaffney. My name only says Dylan up there, but I do have a last name. Um, I was. <laughs> born and raised in Northampton, went to Northampton High School. My parents went to Northampton High School, which I guess makes us somewhat old timers, although other people would differ. Um, I work at Forbes Library in Northampton. I've worked there for 15 years, I think, and then at Lilly Library in Florence for 10 before that. Um, I work in the local history room, so I often have access to, especially now when no one else does, to resources that can be helpful in house searches and house research and things like that. Um, I have two eight-year-old twins who are at Bridge Street right now, or not physically right now, but attending remotely, and uh, yeah, live here in town. Dylan is our go-to person with all the historical information. It's Invaluable, yeah. Okay, Craig. Well, we've got a little different uh, background. Uh, we don't have any kids or grandkids like most of you do, so i now I'm I'm been called to make trouble. So I go and I reassemble that railroad corridor becoming linear parks. <laughs> behind me, there's one of, one of several bridges I've owned over the years. And um, I'm reassembling the 100 mile dead railroad between Northampton and Boston. And we're probably about halfway built out with 80% in some kind of public protected status. And it'll be done in about six years. And uh, my wife is retired. I'm a realtor, Pauline and I are both realtors. And, um, and, and so I'm just having too much fun. We have a breakfast that sits eight feet from the trail here in Florence Village Center. And I love being on the Historical Commission. Um, I grew up in Holyoke, wrote five books, including a book about Florence and one about Holyoke, the cheap Arcadia coffee table books. But, but we just have fun and uh, I look forward to the end of the month meetings here. So, thank you. Thank you for joining us. This is very good. Thank you. Barbara. Oh, hi. Yes. Yeah, yeah. An another time I'll I'll be at a computer with a camera so you don't just have to <laughs> this, but it's only maybe me five years ago. It's pretty recent. Um, but this makes me realize that I first I came to Northampton 50 years ago this fall to go to Smith College. Wow, Barbara. <laughs> 50. <laughs> anyway, um, but it's been great. I mean, we my husband and I never left and they haven't left. And um, I worked in uh, the Mortimer Rare Book Room in Nielsen Library for 35 years, retired about three years ago. I'm also a bookbinder, 
really interested in local history and culinary history. And um, I'm on the board of Historic Northampton. And actually I started really being involved with that organization in the 1970s as a volunteer. And I guess that's it for now. Sarah, do you want to say anything? Sure. Uh, so I'm I'm a native of the Valley. I'm from Southampton originally. Now I live up in Charlemont. Um, my background is in planning as well as public administration, and I'm the staff to the Historical Commission and also um, Historic District Commission through the Planning and Sustainability Office. And I, I wear several other hats there as well. We're, we're a small office, but the, I, I enjoy the Historic Commission. I think the most. Don't tell the other people. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're just saying that because we're here. <laughs> Colleen? Oh, um, well, as Craig mentioned, I am a, a real estate agent. And like Barbara, I'm also a Smith alumna. Um, what can I tell you? I've been in Northampton for uh, just over 40, 40 years. And, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed it here. I wish my kids uh, would move to Northampton, but instead I may be forced to move to where they are. So I don't know how much longer I'm going, I'll be here. But, um, you know, as for long as I'm in Northampton, I'm going to serve on uh, the Historical Commission. I've enjoyed it. And um, I'm also the Historical Commission's representative on the Central Business Architecture uh, Commission as well. Um, and I, might, I could give you a little uh, synopsis of what transpired with uh, the uh, church on Holly Street. Uh, we met, um, I think it was uh, Monday night regarding that. Mm -hmm. Long meeting. So welcome all yeah, both of you new people. Yes, I'll enjoy working with you as well. Thank you. Good to be and here. I'll just I'll just finish. I'm uh, Martha Lyon and I um, am acting as the chair. We've been acting for a couple of years. I guess we should probably do something about that, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and I have been on the commission for um, a a while, I was trying to think, Colleen and I came on at the same time to the Historic District Commission. Oh, that's right. a separate Historic District Commission. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we served on that together for a couple of years. And then the commissions merged, the Historic District Commission and the Historical Commission merged into one commission. So that will all make sense as time goes by to you. But um, I live in the district, the Historic District, and I'm a registered landscape architect and I have a regional practice. I, I work mostly on historic properties all over New York, New England and New York State. Mm. Right. Okay, great. Um, so uh, any mail, Sarah? She's disappeared. Um, okay, any mail? Um, no, there's not. No email, okay. Uh, any other business? Um, Pauline, did you want to give a yeah, you want to quick say summary of the yeah. Central Business Architecture meeting? Yes, yes. So there were uh, there were letters, and uh, many people uh, spoke um, uh, to the commission there, all wanting to see the church preserved. And um, this. Uh, they came in, the architect came in with really very sketchy plans as to what they, uh, uh, as to what they were going to replace the church with. And um, so, you know, really so schematic that it would have been hard to have approved them uh, the way they were. And um, with all of the people, of the neighbors in particular, uh, speaking in favor of preserving the church and trying to reuse it, um, it was decided that the uh, architect and the owner would go back and try to uh, see if they couldn't use the tax credits that would be available uh, uh, to them to uh, try to find a reu you know, reuse for the church and preserve the building. Um, which he said that he would do. Um, one of the speakers who I think was actually from Amherst uh, had numerous articles about successful transformation 
of uses in churches, preserved the buildings, but uh, successfully converted them to apartments. And so this was all throughout Massachusetts. And um, someone else on State Street you know, spoke to the historic credits that were available um, that would certainly make it attractive uh, for the developer to come up with, uh, you know, with a reuse for the building rather than tearing it down. So um, many of the residents who spoke, and I think there were close to a dozen, uh, spoke how they wished that there was a delay, you know, they were hoping that the uh, commission would uh, be able to enforce a delay on the demolition of the church for at least a year uh, so that other uses uh, could, be, uh, could be explored. So at this point, um, the developer has said that he would uh, go and, you know, go back and talk about and explore uh, the, how attractive um, the incentive for using tax credits uh, and perhaps to save the church building. But I don't know if that's really going to, you know, work for them or not. But um, one that we don't want them to tear it down without having, you know, concrete plans that we can actually see, um, you know, before because, you know, things can happen and we could, you could be left, they could tear down the building and be left with an empty lot for, you know, an indefinite amount of time. So, uh, you know, that, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be, uh, a benefit to the city or to the neighborhood. And are you able to request that? It's. Um, Pardon me. Are you able to request that that you they present to you and you approve, so to speak, or at least review plans? Yes. They we yes. Well, they have to. They do as part of the process of approving the demolition. We yeah. have to know what their what their plan is for replacing. Okay. It's that what will go there. It's this odd, you know, if you're on the historical commission, which our demolition review is very different because we're supposed to consider the historical value or significance of the building and we're not even supposed to think about what might be replacing it. And then yeah. on this architecture commission, mm -hmm. it's almost the opposite. The opposite. I mean, because you, you, you certainly can encourage um, a preservation of a building but um, you do have purview over what replaces it. Yes. And, um, and, and as Pauline was saying, that's why I don't think that commission would approve of a demolition without knowing what was gonna replace it. Right. And as I said, uh, you know, their plans, what was presented uh, at, on Monday, at Monday's meeting were two buildings one with three units and one with two units. So it was only a total of five living units um, that they were uh, proposing, you know, for that spot. And it was done in such a, you know, a sketchy way. There was nothing uh, mentioned about materials, um, you know, that I just felt, you know, I wouldn't have been able to vote for it with um, such a skeletal plan. Mm. And, and I think for people who don't know, there's, um, I think it's the same developer. They're already building a bunch of yeah. units sort of behind that. And then their initial plan was, we're going to build these units behind it, demolish the parish hall and the um, parsonage, but keep the church. Right. Now with mm -hmm. COVID, they've, they're saying, you know, the, the business climate, other things have changed so much that they have to change gears. So I think it was the expectation of the neighborhood and of the former um, parishioners of this church that it would be saved and used and it's you know kind of a signature building down there it's representative of the Polish population in Northampton and that history so oh, it's definitely a lot of it's, history it's really um, it's it's frustrated me other buildings that come before the architecture downtown architectural commission that there isn't more that there isn't a delay or a way to try and preserve buildings more. Mm -hmm. it, it really frustrates me that it's almost like you're, they're coming at it with a totally different philosophy about historic buildings. Well, and I think too that they were looking at it, you know, they did say that when they purchased the building, their plan was to keep the church and now they're tearing, now they want to demolish it. 
And so a number of residents did mention that. And I think that they were, it sounded to me like they were using the excuse of COVID, that COVID has changed, you know, the economic, you know, our economics to such a degree, you know, that the church will no longer work for, um, you know, any residential, you know, residential or commercial use, um, you know, restaurants are out. Um, but I just thought, you know, I just mentioned, I said, well, I'm, I'm bullish on Northampton. And I think that once, you know, we're getting vaccinated, the end is in sight. And I think that, uh, you know, because Northampton has had such a vibrant downtown, I don't see it as just dying away. I think that that's going to come back with a force. People are, you know, really, you know, all this pent up energy to get back to normal. People are, you know, as soon as it's safe, people are gonna wanna be out and about. And so, um, you know, I can see where perhaps office use may no longer be, um, you know, where it was. People are finding out that yes, they can work from home. So perhaps office, the demand for office space won't be um, as large, but certainly for, uh, you know, stores and restaurants, I think the demand will definitely be there uh, once, you know, we're, uh, on the other side of this virus. And so I think they were very wrong to blame that, um, you know, the effects of the virus as a reason to demolish the church. So we'll see what they come, you know, we'll see what happens, but we cannot um, prevent them from tearing it down as long as they come up with, um, you know, plans to, you know, put something there. That's so interesting. I agree. I mean, I think that um, we're going to be seeing a lot of, I think we're going to see a lot of people migrate out here because they don't have to work in the city anymore. They can just That's work true. at home. That's true. Um, and the interesting thing that they did mention was that the only place in Northampton where the, I guess there was an overlay of historic uh, commission interest with the central business is St. Mary's Church on Elm Street. Oh. And so if someone comes up with a plan for that, then it will have to come before the historic commission in addition to social right. business. Mm -hmm. in, in, in what way with, with regard to the National Register District? That doesn't sound quite correct. Saint Mar you're talking about, because St. Mary's is typically is technically in the downtown as well as being in the historic yes, district. That's right. Um, overlap. It's, it's in both. Um, mm -hmm. We have a lot of churches, yeah. Boy. The newspaper kept saying that it was O'Connell development, but it never ever named the person in the lead there. Hmm. Who was the lead throughout the entire presentation? Oh, I, you know, I, I can't tell you. There was a representative from uh, O'Connell there. Hmm. So, Harvey and Jonathan, um, this is, you know, it's a learning curve. We're involved in a lot of different things and um, it's little by little, you know, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. And um, we're also, I think everybody knows we are um, hoping to launch, get involved soon in a, a, a preservation planning process for the whole city. Um, the application is up for the Community Preservation Committee to review um, next week, actually. So um, if that is awarded funding, uh, that's going to be an interesting process for us yeah. and very exciting um, and an exciting time too. Um, so a lot of pressure on Northampton to um, accommodate an influx of people, I think, <laughs> and people of means. I mean, Pauline, you didn't come right out and say it, but the house um, on Elm with the windows that sold for over a million dollars. Yeah, right? I wasn't sure what I could, you know, I wasn't sure what I could say or not. Like, oh, they did, they yeah. paid over a million dollars and it was a cash sale. It so was it, not. It was. Oh it my was God. A cash sale. And okay. so I just thought, you know, again, I don't know their particular circumstances, but I just thought people who can pay cash for over a million dollar home, you know, hardship, I don't know. I don't know you know, if that's going to carry a lot of weight or not. Yeah. Yeah. When you mentioned, Martha, you're, you're noted that there's going to be a lot of exodus out of the big cities. We're seeing that. Yeah. We see that all the time. And there's usually 
between 10 and 20 offers on houses around here that go for uh, lots of times cash, not only the one on P30 Elm Street, you see it often. And uh, so it's scary out there, scary to have buyers. Well, and the other, the other thing that um, is happening too, I'll just say, we need to end this meeting, we have a couple of minutes, is um, there are de developers uh, coming into Northampton who are buying up, um, you know, old homes that are, um, I guess I could use the word, they're a little derelict. Um, some of them are very derelict, but some of them are not. They're just sort of, um, you know, they're in, um, they're in more uh, old working class neighborhoods in the city, you know, historic. And the developers are coming in and buying these properties, you know, fairly inexpensively and, um, you know, making some major changes to the look of the neighborhood and the feel. And we recently, um, gosh, it was just within the last couple of months, had a, um, a very, very heated meeting about a property in Bay State that um, is being redeveloped or being proposed to redevelopment. And, you know, we have, to, we have to decide whether the house should be torn down or not. And um, so it, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. And those meetings are, um, they're quite intense. So anyway, <laughs> that's a little bit of a snapshot, but please ask questions. And if at any point um, in the coming months, um, you know, it would be helpful to have to set aside 15 minutes in our meeting to talk about um, one of the efforts that we're involved in to kind of bring you up to speed and also maybe give us a tune up, um, we'd be happy to do that as well, so. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank it's you. Just a minute before seven, so uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Any second? All in favor? Bye. Well, I can't <laughs> wave, but I say yes. <laughs> <laughs>